This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. Welcome to the Open Tuition SEMA P3 Risk Management Lectures. And we start by attempting to define what's meant by risk. And at the top of this slide, uh, we have the idea uh, that risk is the quantifiable dispersion of possible outcomes from any activity. In other words, you can put a figure on it. And, and the quantification, the, the next little definition here, is a combination of the probability of the event and its consequences. Uh, this will be expanded later, but uh, you could have a, a very, very remote uh, event, something that's very unlikely to happen. Its consequences could be substantial, uh, but you're probably not going to lose any sleep over it because you judge the risk to be very, very low. If the risk were higher and the loss was still uh, substantial, then you would be uh, more concerned about that risk. But it has to be quantifiable, uh, both the monetary amount of the loss and also the chance or the probability or the likelihood of that occurring. And typically insurance companies deal with risk. Uh, insurance companies have all sorts of statistics uh, about the uh, car accident rate of, say, young male drivers between the ages of 18 and 20, or female drivers between the ages of 30 and 35, and so on. Uh, they have all sorts of statistics which they use for uh, sickness insurance, uh, travel insurance, uh, so that as you get older or you have certain conditions, uh, they work out the risk that when you're on your two weeks holiday you'll actually f fall ill. And of course life assurance companies uh, have very detailed actuarial uh, statistics about life expectancy say from age of 50 or 60 or 70. Uh, maybe depending also on your personal habits. Uh, for example about your weight, whether you exercise, whether you smoke. If you don't have this kind of numerical information, this quantified information, then you're dealing with a situation of uncertainty uh, and you're much more in the dark when, tr when trying to uh, assess the, the damage that might be done. Uh, you have been able to uh, estimate the probability of this, say, bad thing or indeed good thing actually happening. But, uh, uh, and then it tends to fall back really on how you feel, a much more subjective uh, reaction to uncertainty, but with risk, uh, you can put some figures on it. You have to know the, the types of risk, uh, and, and by and large, uh, when people talk about the, the risk of, a, say, an investment, they are talking about downsize risk. Uh, this is also known as pure risk. This is the possibility that you will make a loss with no chance of a gain. This is pure risk. Uh, strictly speaking, there's also upside risk where there's a possibility of a gain. And when you talk about risk in a kind of generic sense, it means uh, that, that things could go either way. There's a risk, it's a nice risk, but there's a chance, if you like, that things go well or a chance that things go badly. But pure risk is if only things can go badly. For example, uh, the risk that your factory burns down is pure risk. There, there are really no upsides in that. Uh, the risk that an employee gets very severely injured or killed at work is pure risk. If, however, you're launching a new product, then the risk, of course, works both ways. You hope that the new product will be a success and profits will increase. But, of course, from time to time, even very respectable and well-run companies launch products which are a bit of a flop uh, and they, they don't make the profit. And you get similarly these... Uh, uh, speculative uh, risks, this two-way risks, uh, opening in another country could go well, could go badly, taking over a rival could go well, could go badly, uh, trying to develop a new product, uh, will it ever actually come to fruition that you can actually sell it. So do remember what pure risk means. Uh, it means there's only the, the chance really of there being a loss. Risk, if you just mention risk without any sort of qualification, it can be both good news and bad news within that. 
Now, nothing in business will happen unless you are prepared to take some risks. Uh, if you had some money, I suppose the risk-free option you could uh, do with that is to put it in the bank or put it into maybe government uh, securities. Uh, but of course, you get very little return there. Uh, and running all the way through finance is this idea that higher risk uh, will merit higher return or the other way around. You will not get higher return without encountering and suffering and managing higher risk. And we're looking here for a kind of balance uh, here. Uh, we don't want to risk so much that if things go wrong, it could be the ruin of the company. So there has to be conformance. We need controls over the downside risk, the, the chance that our uh, uh, venture in another country goes bad. But on the other side, <clears throat> we want to take advantages of increasing returns. And it's finding out where these, these balances are is important. And there is no single balance point. Different people have got different attitudes uh, uh, really about what they feel comfortable in. So some people are inherently risk averse. Uh, they would be very, very interested in making sure uh, that uh, the controls on the downside risk were really in position very, very carefully. Uh, and they recognize that maybe they're not going to make a fortune, but they sleep better like that. Uh, other people are more risk seeking. Uh, they want really to the, the chance of making a big breakthrough, of making a big you know, success maybe of a product being launched. And they recognize and are quite comfortable with the idea that this could all fall flat on its face. Uh, and what the company has to do is really to, to find a, a balancing point uh, which the stakeholders, and maybe in particular uh, with which the shareholders, feel comfortable. Uh, and not to be going off at kind of radical ideas with, which maybe introduce much more risk than the shareholders or other stakeholders uh, actually bargain for. Now we can look at uh, risk and return, how much risk it's maybe worth taking for a certain amount of return uh, here. Uh, I will just start uh, here, the, the, the top left, is the, the numbers don't really mean particularly much on it here. But here we have low risk, low return. This is the just the bread and butter really, the ordinary course of a business. This is uh, giving some small amounts of credit maybe to a new customer. Of course, you're, you're risking that this new customer may never pay you, uh, but you control that. You get your conformance side of the balance by giving them a, a small credit limit to start with. Uh, and as they prove themselves credit worthy, then maybe you increase it. So this is just normal, everyday kind of business risks, low risk uh, and low return. Here, uh, we have low risk and high return. And this is a kind of no brainer, really. Uh, you see an opportunity, there's very few ways in which you think you're gonna lose a lot of money there, uh, but you foresee that you know if it went well, you're gonna get massive returns. Uh, perhaps uh, an example of this would be that you see a, a well-respected competitor uh, who is in financial difficulties. And uh, what you risk is you take them over. Of course, when you take over a company, you're not quite sure what's what's there and how well it will function. Uh, but you take them over at a, a pretty low price and uh, so on. You you get the, the current management to sign contracts, which will say they're going to be there and still in six months, they're not going to start up in competition with you. And, and if the, the integration goes well between you and your new subsidiary uh, and, and you get economies of scale, etc., then the returns could be very, very high. As I say, it's a kind of no-brainer. You definitely go for that. Across here, where we have high risk and low return, basically you're going to be avoiding that. Uh, so an example might be uh, you uh, see some opportunities, uh, but they are in a country which is politically unstable. Why on earth uh, would you spend a lot of money uh, putting investment into a country that was politically unstable, uh, that may even be on the verge of going to war, so the risk of losing that money is terribly high. And even if it went well, uh, the, the population and the economy of that country isn't going to 
and make a lot of return for you. And the final one, you're in a bit of a, a quandary, not quite knowing what uh, to do. There is high risk and there is high return. Uh, and this is the sort of opportunity that might actually keep you awake at night, uh, fretting and worrying about whether you should do this or not. So it, it might be, uh, should we try to develop a fantastic new website? Uh, there's a high risk that the fantastic new website maybe doesn't work as well as we uh, thought it would. Uh, but if it does work, <clears throat> then we're going to be uh, attracting maybe a worldwide audience to our company. Generally speaking, when it says examine carefully, you would be really anxious and trying to collect more and more and more information to, to try and guide you about the risk and return uh, before you, you kind of uh, finally make the decision whether to go for the opportunity or not. Risks are classically divided into a number of different categories. Uh, and we have strategic and operational risks. Uh, and then we have uh, compliance and reporting risks we'll see at the moment. Uh, but basically, if you see uh, ever see the word strategy here or strategic, think long term. When people talk about a company's strategy, they're talking about the long term plan. Uh, with a time horizon of something like five to ten years. So, so th this is a risk that really arises from, from taking a, almost a major wrong turning. Uh, you decide to rely on outdated uh, technology. Perhaps uh, that's what's happened to Nokia. It had a fantastic uh, reputation in the mid-2000s. Uh, had, a, I think, about 60% of the mobile phone market. Uh, and then, of course, along came smartphones, like the iPhone in particular, uh, and kind of leapfrogged over uh, Nokia and, to some extent, BlackBerry. Uh, and uh, Nokia really isn't isn't heard about very much more. There could be a competitor action. You think a competitor isn't interested in a particular market, but suddenly goes into it, or or a competitor uh, suddenly has a, a price cutting exercise and really puts a lot of pressure on you there. Maybe even a competitor pulls out of the market uh, and they pull out of the market and that looks as though it might keep it open to you uh, but it means the competitor has got uh, perhaps not conserved a lot of cash and can make a, a much better attack on another market. Reliance on a declining market or a declining economy in a particular country uh, so we are still maybe making a slightly old product or, or we uh, haven't recognised that people's tastes have changed. We're still trying to make our money maybe selling CDs uh, when uh, most of the money is made by MP3 downloads. There's obviously a little bit of a connection between outdated technology and a declining market. Uh, if you want to distinguish them, think maybe the declining market has something to do with almost personal taste whereas the technology is the much more technological-based one. We have reputational risks. At the time of recording this, uh, we're not very long after Volkswagen uh, was discovered to have been uh, misreporting the emissions from its cars. And this has done that com company huge reputational damage. Its sales have really fallen away uh, very, very quickly uh, indeed. It's probably can be put right, uh, but it's going to take years to uh, really get the reputation of Volkswagen back again and for people to trust it. It's really a, an element of trust. Other companies which suffer from reputational risks have been pharmaceutical companies uh, where maybe it has been discovered that they have been covering up adverse reports and side effects from drugs. And, and you know, a reputation that have taken years to build up you know, goes in a matter of days. And there are financial risks. Financial risks uh, that maybe we have too much borrowing in our capital structure uh, and that we can't repay the loans and the capital uh, as they become due. So those are long-term types of risks. Operational risks are more the day-to-day -day risks. These are basically things just going wrong. Uh, so the examples we have here, human error, uh, that, that somebody maybe doesn't shut off a machine properly. And because the machine isn't shut up properly, then you have released nasty stuff into the local river. 
could be somebody who hasn't set the machine properly and you produce you know 10,000 units which have to be scrapped uh, because of the wrong size. Fraud is a risk. We will be looking at fraud uh, later. Uh, but obviously, uh, somebody putting their hand in a till, stealing inventory, are short-term operational sort of risks. Non-compliance with regulations, we can cover that also separately in compliance risks. Uh, loss of key people. Uh, so our best salesperson goes, maybe goes off to a rival. Uh, and we're left with very little information, perhaps, uh, of who the good customers are and what's been promised to them. A lot of IT risks will fall into this as well. The risk of a hacker getting into your uh, name and address book of your customers, uh, maybe getting access to their credit card numbers. The, the risk of the computer simply breaking down for longer than really your customers are willing to tolerate. Uh, these are health and safety risks, a worker being injured. These are all operational risks. Reporting and compliance risks. Uh, we report, of course, we have a financial statement reports uh, once a year. Uh, but of course, most companies once a month have their management accounting. Uh, and if the management accounting is drawn up incorrectly, we have a wrong view of the profits compared to the budget. We have a wrong view of what the long term outcome is going to be for you know, this year. Then we're going to be making wrong decisions. Or if we're not having reported properly that there's maybe a quality problem or if somebody doesn't tell us that maybe a customer is grumbling a little bit, then essentially there's a, a flaw, a problem in the reporting uh, which will cause risk. And the final category is compliance risk. There are more and more rules and regulations with which we have to comply on businesses have to comply. And if you don't do this, then there can be considerable downside risks. There are fines, there are court actions, there can be damages, and you could even lose your right or license to operate as a particular sort of a business. Uh, so these could put you out of business. We have a couple of slides now just listing a great collection, if you like, of different sorts of risks. Don't for goodness sake learn this risk or this list of risks. Uh, the list is here simply to kind of open your imagination a little bit about all the various directions uh, that the slings and arrows of our outrageous fortune uh, can come at you uh, from. So we have environmental risks. Uh, this is, for example, maybe affecting uh, some uh, companies in agriculture, where if there is global warming or a drought and the crops fail, uh, or the new different sorts of crops, then there is environmental risk. The other type of environmental risk is, of course, that you are releasing stuff into the atmosphere, into the water supply, which is going to cause damage. Economic risks. Interest rates go up. You're selling goods which are discretionary goods. People don't have to buy them. And if people are having to pay more for their mortgage or are worried about their job because of the bad economy, they'll cut back on what they're buying from you. Competitor risk. A competitor suddenly has a breakthrough and comes out with a fantastic uh, uh, product. Uh, again, you're going to be in, in some difficulty. Product risk. Maybe it has to be withdrawn. From time to time, we have uh, programs where cars have to be withdrawn because the airbag is liable to, to go off for no particular reason. Commodities, supply and price. Uh, some commodities, uh, some rare earths, for example, uh, they are in short supply. Maybe the supply comes from one or two countries uh, and uh, you are, these are vital components in what you're making. You are liable to maybe have price shocks or maybe the supply is cut off. Political, cultural, legal, for example, a change in government. And the new government uh, suddenly doesn't want to spend public money uh, as much. Or a law is passed which uh, says something about a minimum wage uh, and suddenly your profits are being squeezed. Financial risk, currency, interest rate and so on, we have a whole two sections on that later. Uh, but if you were exporting to America, say, and a dollar got weaker, then when those dollars are transferred back to your own currency, you could be a little bit disappointed. Investment risk, investment goes down. IT risk, we've talked about already. 
knowledge management. Uh, a lot of knowledge and information is held in people's heads. Uh, and when these people go off and join a competitor, they take this information with them. Not only does it help the competitor, but it leaves you with a bit of an empty cupboard when it comes to knowing perhaps what customers want and appreciate uh, and what they've been promised. Property risk, the risk that it is damaged, the risk that uh, it loses value in some way. Health and safety, a kind of plain really people getting hurt. Customers, staff would be the main ones. Uh, a trading risk, uh, perhaps uh, someone doesn't pay you or perhaps the, uh, the, the, the goods get lost in, in transit. Resource risks, you can't put your, you know, simply recruit enough people. Uh, and for some professions in the UK engineering, uh, a great uh, shortage of some types of qualified engineer that's really holding back some companies. Organizational uh, risks, uh, an example might be if you have many, many tiers of management, what is called a very tall, narrow management structure, it takes a long time for information from the bottom, and maybe it's the people at the bottom who know a lot, uh, to go up through these layers of management. Each time it goes through a manager, it's probably going to be interpreted and kind of rebroadcast. And by the time it gets to the person at the top, the message is entirely different, and it's taken a long time. Fraud risks, that's okay. Property risks, uh, kind of a little bit close to fraud. Uh, but uh, giving maybe a customer a bribe uh, to place an order with you. Uh, and of course, there are in many countries ferocious fines and uh, legal uh, uh, problems will, will arise if you're caught doing that. And reputational risks we've, we've talked about. Risk appetite uh, is a very important uh, concept uh, here. Risk appetite is the nature and strength of risks that the organization is willing to bear. Uh, so let's just take uh, the shareholders of a company. Uh, are they shareholders who are risk seeking or are they risk averse? Uh, and again, as I said, th there's no right and wrong answer to this. By and large shareholders who have maybe come up to retirement, who are reliant on their pension funds and don't want to see those pension funds shrink now, uh, they would tend to be more risk averse. Uh, whereas if you have a youngish person, 25, putting money into the pension, not needing it maybe for another 40 years or so, it, in a way it doesn't matter if the, the stock exchange goes down. It's got, it's got 30, 40 years to come up again and for you to recoup some of that investment. Now this is determined by two things, your risk averse or your risk appetite really. First of all there is your risk attitude. The director's views and the director's views should reflect the shareholders views uh, about the level of risk they think desirable. Uh, are, are we a company which does gamble a bit or are we a, a company which is very very conservative really on the sort of investments we will make. But the second component is your risk capacity. Uh, how much could you bear to lose, really? So let's say you had $100,000 in the bank. Uh, and uh, let's say there was a famous horse race coming up. And the odds in the horse race, or one particular horse, was 100 to 1. So high risk, high risk of losing. Uh, and uh, you uh, have 100,000 pounds in the bank, though. So you could afford to lose 1,000 without hardly feeling it. So you could argue that, that many people uh, who like a bit of a gamble might be attracted to odds of 100 to 1 and because they'll barely feel it, they've got a very high risk capacity, they could be quite happy to, to put a thousand pounds on the 100 to 1 horse. If however that uh, same person only had 1,000 pounds in the bank, uh, the chances of them gambling all of that £1,000 on that 100 to 1 horse is very small. So it's how much can you bear, uh, but then at the same time there are also some people uh, who might even see odds of 2 to 1 
uh, and it wouldn't matter if they're £100,000 in the bank, they wouldn't even bet £100 because they're simply not into gambling. They, they don't even like very good odd of odds of maybe, maybe two to one. So remember, risk appetite, the amount of risk that the organisation is willing to bear, depends on the attitude of the people uh, and also uh, how much they can bear, really without getting into serious trouble. Finally, in this chapter, we'll just run down the uh, benefits of risk management uh, here. First of all, more predictable cash flows. Cash flow forecasts are, of course, very important in businesses to make sure you stay under your overdraft limit and, uh, and so on. Uh, but if you're taking risks with investments, or if you're risking large fines, uh, or if you're risking making uh, substandard materials so it has to be come back and reworked, and those customers abandon you, then your cash flows are going to be very erratic. Uh, risk management does imply well-run systems. Uh, we have to know what's happening in the organisation. We have to be able to control and measure it in some way. Uh, and generally speaking, a well-run system is going to be better just in general management. Uh, risk management, part of risk management is, is saying, well, what are we going to do if the worst does happen? If there is a bit of a disaster, uh, and part of risk management is saying, right, this could happen. Let's put some fallback or emergency arrangements in place. And then if bad things do happen, yeah, you can probably keep trading. There's greater confidence among investors, uh, employees, customers, suppliers, partners with whom you might have a joint venture and so on. And generally speaking, if there's greater confidence amongst investors here, uh, this will mean that there's a lower cost. Lower cost of finance. If you go along to a bank and you ask for a loan, uh, one of the, the major determinants of the interest rate is the bank's perception of risk. So you are starting a new business up, you've got no track record, and you need a loan, interest rates are liable to be fairly high. And indeed, if you're, if you're going to get equity investment, the equity investors would expect or hope for a fairly high return. If, however, you are a very well-run, stable, blue-chip company, you know, in the stock exchange top 100 shares and fantastic track record, uh, and you're in a sort of a business, uh, kind of consumer-led business, maybe something like Unilever, uh, then you are perceived as having very low risk indeed. Uh, and investors will be willing to put money into your company, loans or equity, at a much lower rate of return. So you can raise cheaper finance. And if you look at uh, customers and suppliers, look at customers, why would they keep trading with a company which in some way was unreliable, or which had a, a bit of a shady reputation? Uh, they will be looking for uh, a company that they could depend on. And finally, uh, better matching uh, between the risk appetite uh, of the shareholders and what the company actually undertakes with risk. If you don't manage risk, if you don't know what it is, how can you possibly be trying to give the shareholders and other stakeholders the correct amount of risk? And to reiterate again, uh, risk management is not about removing all risk. If you remove all risk, you remove all return. You just be putting your money under the floorboards. I mean, that's not even risk-free. Uh, but you are getting this balance between, and being open about it, here's the sort of risk which you will be experiencing, and here's the sort of return uh, that you are hoping for. This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from opentuition.com.